Welcome to Birdsong, I'm your host Kayuta Kiora, and in this particular episode we have Lane Wilkin joining us. Lane is a scholar, a cultural tattoo practitioner known as a Mamba Batok, and he is an advocate for the critically endangered practice of Batok, which are the cultural tattoos of the Philippines. He has studied a great many of the indigenous traditions of the Philippines and the greater Pacific region, with nearly three decades of research and experience within this field. When it comes to his own ancestral lineage, his mother is from the Philippines and his father is of English and Scandinavian descent, similar to myself, and he is the author of Filipino Tattoos, Ancient to Modern, and The Forgotten Children of Maui, Filipino Myths, Tattoos, and Rituals of a Demigod. He has also been a contributing writer to Back from the Crocodile's Belly, Philippine Babylon Studies and the Struggle for Indigenous Memory, and Shamanic Transformations, True Stories of the Moment of Awakening, as well as several other articles for various magazines and journals. I really enjoyed this conversation with Lane and with so much and so much more that I wanted to explore, we end up diving in and out of our themes and topics which cover traditional cultural tattoo, animism, shamanism, mythology, origin stories, similarities between not just the Philippines but many of the islands and cultures within and around the Pacific. We talk cultural restoration and several other threads that we stitched into the fabric of our dialogue. And Lane is walking a really interesting, inspiring, and important path in life. So full respect to him for heeding the call of heart, soul, and spirit. I won't keep you waiting any longer. Let's get straight into it. Thanks for being here. And I trust that you will find value in our dialogue to carry with you on your own path forward. Lane, I'm really excited that you are here joining me. So firstly, before we dive into the heart of our dialogue, I want to extend my thanks for making the time to have this conversation. And I also want to welcome you to the show. And secondly, I want to introduce you to one of the greater themes here at Birdsong, which we were just speaking about, and that is honoring the sacred. And when guests join me for these conversations, what I have been doing is inviting them to share a few words, to open up our time together, to open up our space together. And this finds parallels within how we might open up ceremonial or ritualistic or sacred space in regards to the words or the gestures or the incantations, poems, stories, songs that we might share, that we might share to... We, that we might offer to the space, to our ancestors, to spirit, to the mystery. So in light of opening up our time together and our space together and in the spirit of honoring the sacred, I'd love to invite you to share a few words. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, I will just like to utter a short prayer. O ako ang mga inanailangitan, manakabalin amin, umayman kayo, apo na marsuwa tayo, tapno makiinana kayo, dadakol tayo amin, tayo tayo na kayo ako, kablawan ta kayo amin. Um, that uh, prayer is in Ilocano, uh, my mother's language, and uh, basically is to invite the great mother, the great father, the ancestors, the creator, to come and join and to rest among us uh, so that we may honor them and welcome them. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Lane. It's an honor. So in our initial email exchange, I mentioned that we both share similar ancestry. My mom is Filipino. I was born in Manila and mm -hmm. my dad is Australian. I grew up over here ever since I was young, since I was about two years old. And his grandparents are of English, Irish and Scandinavian nice. descent. <laughs> yeah. Very similar, right? Yeah. And 
looking at DNA tests, things get even more interesting for me beyond that immediate ancestry. But in the greater timeline of my life, it's only recently that I have found the spark of intrigue, the spark of curiosity to look deeper into my own ancestral roots, which is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to have you on and to learn more off you and to follow those breadcrumbs further down the path. But before we do get deeper down that path, perhaps a great place to start maybe to provide a little bit of context for myself and our listeners, it would be great to invite you to share some of your own story of how you got to be where you are today. And what I'm interested in is if you have had an interest in ancient Filipino and related indigenous cultures, traditions, and mythologies from an early age, or was this something that you stumbled upon later, Also, obviously including the traditional cultural practice of Filipino tattooing? as well so i'd love to hear a little bit about this journey of yours uh a little of the both are true um as a young uh boy i was always interested in mythology and then i also heard stories from my grandparents uh folk tales and things like that uh but my my real interest in the ancient cultures of the philippines did not start until i was 19 years old Mm. and um i had moved to hawaii and there was just something strange about Hawaii. It's just uh, what I would describe as a familiar spirit about everything, the culture, the land. Uh, it felt like deja vu a lot of the time. And uh, I didn't know how to reconcile it. I felt related to the Hawaiian people, but couldn't put my finger on it. You know, growing up, I always thought of myself as Asian uh, because geographically, Uh, The Philippines has been regulated to what we describe as Southeast Asia. And that's a little bit misleading, I think, because although there is Asian DNA in our gene pool, um, Hmm. you have to realize that the Philippines is a product of admixture, which has been happening for more than a millennia with mainland Asia and the Pacific. And so we're really kind of a conglomerate race. um, And we are culturally as well as genetically related to the people you would think of as Polynesian or Micronesians or or even Melanesians. Um, that family uh, extends from Taiwan to Madagascar to Easter Island. And uh, some of the some of the uh, continent of Asia down in Southeast Asia. Uh, that's all one language family. And so you know, being there in Hawaii, you know, I was trying to reconcile why I felt uh, very comfortable around Hawaiian culture and why I felt a kinship. At the time, I didn't know. I thought of myself as just Asian, similar to Chinese. But uh, over the next probably two decades, I did research to explain that connection that I felt um, and found that we are very closely related uh, and more so anciently uh, with what we think of as the Pacific Islanders. And we can actually trace our oral histories back, our genealogies back to the very same ancestors by name. Uh, mm-hmm. Maui is one of those ancestors that people are more familiar with. Uh, but he's a little bit farther down on the, on the genealogical tree from, from those that we claim as common parents, uh, although we do share him in common as well. And so, you know, that explained a lot. You know, if you uh, if you went back 500 years to uh, pre-contact, uh, pre-Spanish contact uh, Philippines, you would recognize so much of the culture as what we think of as Polynesian today. And so this whole journey for me really ended up and is still continuing, I should say, uh, with the practice of doing uh, tattooing which I never intended to do. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to research about them. I wanted to learn about the tattoos. I wanted to receive the appropriate marks for my heritage. Mm-hmm. Uh, never envisioned myself as doing the practice, but uh, uh, long story short, many people have heard this already in previous uh, podcasts, but my, uh, my father had uh, gotten cancer and uh, a very aggressive cancer, mesothelioma. 
And he uh, called me up one day, told me that he had cancer, he was going to fight it. And so I went down to Arizona to spend time with him to take him to his appointments. And and while we were doing that, the oncologist decided that he should have radiation treatment in the hopes of just prolonging his life. It, um, most people don't recover from mesothelioma. Mm. And so the they had put in Sharpie on his body these little uh, radiation targets uh, for the computer to aim at and, you know, irradiate his body, hoping to prolong his life. And they said, Mr. Wilkin, we'd like to tattoo these radiation targets on you. And he said he'd think about it. And so we we're talking afterwards. And he said, you know, Lane, I... I don't want a man I don't know with a machine I don't know um, touching my body, tattooing me. You've been studying tattooing for the last 20 years. You tattooed me. And uh, I refused that calling up until that point. That, at that point, I, I couldn't refuse my dying father. And, uh, and so I got a, a wooden dowel, uh, drilled a hole in it, picked the lemon thorn from my mother's tree, uh, pushed it through that hole in the end of the stick, got another stick to tap it with, and some India ink, and my brother stretched the skin while I tattooed those radiation targets on my father. And those were the first tattoos that I did. Uh, it was a sacred experience for me, um, even though it was for modern medicine. You know, it was a hell of an initiation. <laughs> uh, uh, and probably the only way I would have tattooed because I was very opposed to, you know, picking up the practice. I, I really didn't want the responsibility, mm. but, uh, Sometimes that's the way callings go in life is that we resist them and we resist them until uh, circumstances persuade us uh, to do the work. Well, my father, he ended up passing away. And um, I had told some of my uh, friends and associates about my experience with it. And uh, in the Filipino community, people began asking me to do the ritual work for them. And they... I've done my best to to work in the Filipino American community, uh, serving them as uh, as a practitioner. And over time, people began referring to me as a mamba yeah, uh, which is for those of you that may not know, a, a tattoo ritualist or cultural tattooist. Mm. And uh, and I have done my best to live up to that title. The community has has addressed me by. Uh, I feel I still feel very underqualified to do the work. Um, but I do my best in to in the words of, of one of my teachers, you know, uphold the responsibility that has been given to me. Um, mm -hmm. My one of my teachers, uh, Sua Keone Nunes, uh, once said, you know, because he was trying to persuade me to, to do the work, even though I had published the book Filipino Tattoos Ancient to Modern, thought, okay, my responsibility is over. I've published this work and someone else can pick up, you know, where I leave off. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, you, now it's your responsibility to put into practice and all those elders and all that ancestral knowledge that, that have been, you know, have bestowed this upon you, it would be, they're responsible for you to not act on it. And so here it is uh, over eight years later now. And uh, I've been privileged to serve so many people in our community. And not just Filipino Americans, but people back home, uh, people from Australia, mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand, uh, Europe, um, all over the world. Uh, I've either traveled to them or they've traveled to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's been a very powerful experience. It's been a wonderful uh, journey in and of itself, uh, helping me uh, with my own spiritual growth and understanding and in certainly enhancing the connection that uh, I have and, and that I hope 
uh, other people receive through this work, uh, that connection to the ancestors. Mm. Uh, because a lot of these designs, they represent them. They may be stylized, you may not see an actual human figure, but they, these designs, they represent those who came before us and those who will come after us. And that's, when you understand it that way, it's kind of a heavy responsibility to do right <laughs> by our people. <laughs> you know? I don't, I don't, I don't want to transition and uh, have some angry people on the other side saying, hey, why do you... Uh, put the wrong marks <laughs> on my descendant or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, look, there are a lot of parallels in regards to my own journey when you're speaking about resisting the call, in particular when it comes to being in a position of offering and serving particular sacred medicines to community and also stepping into that role to hold ceremonial and ritualistic space. And it was kind of a similar thing for me where I was spending many, many years documenting, researching both through written word and digital word, and also having that experiential understanding as well through direct personal knowing, direct personal experience. Um, but a time came when the calling was coming through to step into a role of greater responsibility and start being a medicine carrier myself and a carrier of ancient wisdom and various traditions. But at the same time, I didn't feel worthy. I had the typical mind chatter yes. of... Who am I to be doing this? Who am I to be stepping into this role? And look, even to some degree, like you were speaking to before, for me as well, there's still some of that present, but I think it comes from a different place now. It's rather than a self-worth thing or a, a lack of self-worth, it's a genuine humility to the depth and the sacredness of this work and recognizing that I am still a humble student and I will always be. And we know the cliche saying, saying the more that you know, the more that you realize that you yes. don't know. But of course, like you say, a, a time comes or it can come when it's up to us to heed the call and step up into greater levels of responsibility. And through that, we are, <clears throat> we're honoring the ancient ones. We're honoring our ancestors. We're honoring spirit. We're honoring the great mystery. So look, something that I have been sitting with lately is it's not just the fact that I'm carrying these certain sacred medicines and certain sacred traditions and ancient wisdom traditions and all of that, but recognizing that they are actually carrying me yes. as well. So I'm not just carrying them, but they are carrying me. So it's a, a potent reframe to a deepening of relationship. So to dive a little bit deeper into more of what you were speaking to, Philippines yes. uh, was originally called by the Spaniards Las Islas uh, de los Pintados. Right. Or right. the islands of the, the painted people, right? Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So from what I've researched, some of the oldest bone tattooing tools were discovered in the Philippines dating to roughly 4,000 years ago. So is that what you've come across? And can you take us a little bit deeper into all of this? Right, right. There was a, an excavation in the Cagayan Valley in northern Luzon uh, in the Arku Caves. And, they, and these were burial caves and they found these tattooing combs, uh, similar to what you find in Polynesia. Uh, and they've been carbon dated at uh, anywhere from uh, 3,700 uh, years old to older. And of course, they're going to look at the mean between those those numbers. So we're looking at around 4,000 years old. And this is only the artifacts that we've discovered. It's possible that the practice is much older than that. Um, but it's, uh, it is a very old practice. We've Our ancestors have had thousands of years to explore this practice. Uh, everything from... Uh, the symbolism of it, the, the spiritual aspect of it, the, the physical enhancement of it, and beyond uh, beautification. Uh, there's actually, uh, uh, it's actually used as a medicine. Uh, and we've found uh, in the last five years, my apprentices and I have discovered that uh, there is a correlation between a Chinese understanding of meridian lines and acupuncture points 
with the placements of these designs on the body. Um, and we've put them to the test. We've uh, discovered that, yeah, these are not just uh, for aesthetic purposes. They they actually functioned as a, a way to mm. accumulate and concentrate mm. personal power and uh, energy. And so it's uh, it's been a, a very humbling experience learning and researching about this because you know people look to me and they're like oh you're an expert lena i'm not an expert you know 30 years of, of studying this is is a is a pittance compared to thousands of years of, of history mm-hmm. and understanding we're just trying to pick up the breadcrumbs really and uh and i'm just astounded by the genius that our ancestors had everything from the application of these designs to the geometry of them. Um, that's one thing that I'm, I've yet to really dive into is that there is these uh, little nuances that allude to sacred geometry and e- even to, uh, um, without wanting to dive too deep, uh, uninformed, because I'm still doing research on it, but the, there is a, uh, Allusions in the designs that um, seem to be remembrances of psychedelic trips, and uh, and so there's there's an even deeper layer there besides what I've already explored that that really needs to be delved into as well. Mm. Yeah, if we were to zoom out, I might make the guess that a lot of the symbols that were utilized were originally chosen due to the animistic relationship that our ancestors had with their environment, you know, their relationship with the natural world, with the signs, the symbols, the motifs, the animals. I would guess that they were largely arising from nature that they had formed a deep connection with that spanned generation to generation. And it's so interesting that you were touching on this because I was going to bring this up. I was also wondering if there was any correlation with altered states of consciousness and any of the symbols that, the symbols, the signs, you know, the the geometric patterns that we come across in these spiritual dimensions, these higher states of consciousness. And I was wondering if they were linked into any of the signs, symbols, designs that we find in traditional tattoo culture because we see a similar thing in ancient cave paintings from many different parts of the globe. Right, right. Um, We don't have a whole lot of, um, other than like alcohol and uh, betel nut, uh, we don't have a lot of usage currently of anything that is mind altering. Um, there are uh, substances found in our islands that, uh, like, for example, acacia is found uh, in our islands. And that's a very high, that has a very high concentration of DMT. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've found in some of the Philippine archives in uh, the Chicago Field Museum uh, that uh, we've been very fortunate to have access to uh what you would describe uh, as headlays or, or a balanga uh, that goes around the head made of acacia leaves. And that also implies uh, that they had a knowledge of uh, some of these uh, altered states of consciousness and substances. Uh, we have uh, kava or wild kava that grows in the Philippines. Uh, most Filipinos don't even know that it grows there. Uh, most Polynesians don't know that it grows there. Uh, and it's referred to as uh, Cuyo or Cuyot. Um, this, is, uh, this is also a medicine way, uh, 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 also induces an altered state of consciousness that is used throughout the Pacific uh, in places like Fiji and Vanuatu and in Hawaii for uh, communication with your ancestors to enhance that communication. Uh, So there are uh, substances that induce altered states of consciousness, but there's documentation, like, for example, with the with the Puyo, the Pava, that by the early 20th century had been completely forgotten. And there was actually when the when the the Philippines was a U.S. territory, there was a, a company Sears and Roebuck that was trying to market Philippine Kava to 
the United States as a type of temperance wine. But obviously that didn't go over very well. <laughs> it's, it's quite bitter. Sure. But uh, it's been completely forgotten by our people. And uh, that's one of my, my side projects uh, is uh, to restore uh, cultural awareness among our people of some of these plant medicines. But uh, yeah, the, that all also ties back into animism and the understanding uh, that are that you find throughout the Philippines of that everything has a spirit. Uh, there is a spirit of a place or a plant or an animal, but then there is these unseen uh, entities that also inhabit these things, or that inhabit trees or stones or even termite mounds. Uh, sometimes uh, those of us in the diaspora are familiar with this, and sometimes we are not. When you pass a banyan tree, for example, you are supposed to say tabi tabi po, uh, literally to move aside. You don't want to offend those that are living there. And those uh, balete or banyan trees were used anciently for uh, deification of the dead. So the spirits that might be inhabiting it, we sometimes refer to them as duendes, but, which is a Spanish term for, for little uh, little people or dwarves, but we also refer to them as Ninuno or ancestors. So it kind of goes back into some of our afterlife beliefs where those that die go to the afterlife and they're reincarnated in the afterlife nine times until each generation will be taller until the ninth generation. And then they are buried in a coffin the size of a grain of rice. And then basically are uh, this is a description, a figurative description of how ancient these ancestors are. It's like a, a type of perspective. The farther that you get away from something, the smaller it appears. And so after nine generations, if no one has done a paganito or a ceremony to give them access to the proper life, they're in this holding place called Sulad that is the uh, name of the underworld. And in the underworld is where we get reunited with our ancestors and ascend into a type of higher existence or paradise. Uh, if no one, if they are not properly tattooed or if they're not ornamented with enough gold or their, their descendants have not performed a, a paganito, they become smaller and smaller until they are forgotten. And so mm. the baleti tree, you know, I'm circling back around here. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the baleti tree, is, it houses uh, these ancient ones. And so that's why you should show respect uh, in front of those ancestors when you pass by those trees uh, to these anito. Um, and so you say tabi tabi po when you, when you are near them and God forbid you pee on them, you know, just, or anything like that. Um, but uh, what would happen in the old days is that, you know, like a, a prominent babaylan, which would be, a shaman, what you think of as a shaman in, in the Visayas in southern Philippines. Uh, mm. Sometimes after they die, they would be temporarily interred in a grave. And at the year anniversary, which we still keep to this day, uh, we have year anniversary of the death of a loved one. And nowadays it's a very abbreviated form of this. We just go and put food on the grave sometimes and remember them tell stories about them. Uh, but in the old days, we would we would exhume the dead. Um, we would strip the bones of the remaining flesh. Uh, the bones would be painted in uh, red ochre. And then they would be buried in uh, new coffins or in jars uh, after celebrating them, giving them food offerings. But someone prominent like a Datu or a, a Babaylan, they would put their bones inside of a baleti tree uh, inside the banyan trees. And these things, as they grow, they send down new roots from the top. They kind of grow from the top down. And eventually those bones would become enshrouded in the baleti tree. And so the, it absorbs the, the mana or the power, or the, kala, the kala rua or the, um, the soul or the kalag of the the Babaylan. Sorry, I had to go through all these different languages to arrive at the right term in, in Visaya. But, um, but uh, their power, their soul uh, 
permeated that tree and, the, and in a very real way the tree becomes the ancestor uh, it not only houses the bones but becomes the ancestor and you can imagine what would happen if you uh, received permission from those spirits to use the wood of that tree to create effigies for example the, the effigy is made from the wood of the ancestor now it is the ancestor uh, uh, one of my apprentices, he uses the wood of the Baleti tree to, to form his tools, to make his tools. And how sacred is that, you know, that, you're, that you are holding your ancestor in your hands to create your ancestor's marks upon someone's body. It's powerful. It's uh, amazing. And, uh, so anyway, I'm kind of rambling on there. If I, sorry about no, that. I, no, don't be sorry. This is all fascinating. This is stuff that I'm very, very interested in. And my great grandmother was a, a folk healer from Malinao. But before that, any information on our ancestry kind of disappears into the clouds. But I feel it in my bones that somewhere along the lineage, some, I don't know how far back, but someone was tied into what we might consider to be the Filipino equivalent of a, a medicine man or perhaps a medicine woman you know, linked into shamanism, being a spirit guide, a ritualistic healer, communicator with the spirit world. And I know that some of your kind of immediate ancestry goes down that path as well. Yeah, my my uh, my inang baklet, my or Lola, my grandmother. She she was a healer. She was a uh, uh, mang anito. She was a uh, mang alas or mang ilot. She uh, she did it all <laughs> kind of a thing. Uh, she was a, a very powerful woman and actually terrified me sometimes <laughs> because just right. such a presence. But yeah. Mm. Um, she passed away long it's been it's been well over two decades now but yeah powerful woman mm. when you were growing up were you initiated into any particular rituals or ceremonial practices that your grandmother was involved in so my mother was supposed to pick that up where my lola uh, left off mm. uh, she was supposed to inherit all of that but she ran away to the american air base there in clark and went to work when she was a teenager and uh, so my my mother knows some of the rituals she knows some of the practices um, i gleaned a little from my my grandmother and my grandfather while they were still alive uh, but it uh, she my my mom she never put it into practice and then one day, uh, this is well before I started tattooing, um, I activated, so to speak. Uh, things went off, things got turned on, and I didn't know what was going on with me. And uh, then when I asked my uncles and my mom about they're like, oh, yeah, you got that from our side. And, uh, you know, it's this is what you can do with it. And this is, you know, what you, you should and shouldn't do with it. And. I was never, but I was never initiated into um, a formal practice the way, like, uh, for example, among our Ifugao cousins, they're Mumbaki, they're, they have a very formal apprenticeship and initiation. Mm -hmm. uh, some places it's just something that's handed down from parent to child, uh, runs in particular lines of genealogy. Um, but for others, they... They uh, it skips several generations, and then you have a descendant. That's like all of a sudden, uh, they don't know why they're called to it. They're drawn to it, and it's funny because we we encounter people like that all the time. They come to me for batok or, or tattoos, and um, they don't know why they're like the way they are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of a lot of my apprentices also have gifts, and so we recognize them when they're coming through, and they're like, "Oh, somebody's coming through. It's time to educate them about uh, about what their gifts are and uh, help them explore that a little." And that's very rewarding to find others like that uh, and help them understand uh, their gifts from a cultural paradigm rather than a Western. Uh, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, eclectic knowledge out there, but when you get to uh, understand things from your own ancestry, from that paradigm, it's it's very empowering, I think. Mm. 
Yeah, I think because many of us have been cut off from our ancestral lineages, the unbroken lineage from generation to generation to generation, perhaps there are a lot more people who tend to find some sort of passageway into what we might articulate as self-initiation. You know, we don't necessarily have the elders or the wise ones or the grandparents, the grandfathers, the grandmothers to guide us into cultural traditions, wisdom traditions, rites of passage from one stage of life to another. So perhaps there's something you know, inherent that calls us out to us and that sparks this uh, this desire or this feeling, this, this want yeah. for self-initiation into many aspects of life and different ways of living and breathing and being. But to circle back to what you were touching on before, I don't know if this is the case, but I have read it in several texts that it was usually the females, the women, rather than the men who were initiated into being the shamans, the babaylans. Um, usually females, but not always the case. There, uh, in in the Visayas, uh, most of the babaylans are are women. Uh, sometimes infertile, or uh, what we call here in the states, I don't know if it's the same terminology down there, uh, intersex or hermaphrodite uh, individuals so these were uh, they were very uh, specific in the Visayas of who could who of the male gender or could participate uh, up north in among Ilocanos um, the Baglan which would be the equivalent or cognate of uh, Babaylan or a Bailan down south the Baglan they uh, they could be men mm. But when they officiated in, in their office as a baglan, they were expected to dress uh, in a, with uh, women's clothing and accoutrements um, because uh, women were considered inherently more spiritually connected and powerful than men are. Uh, there are men that, have, that are the exception to the rule, uh, but usually that's, uh, that's a, a female role. Um, so yeah, uh, and, it, and then it varies down south in Mindanao, you have you have bylan that are men, uh, hmm. so it's not it's not a hard fast rule that it was usually women. Mm. Yeah, look, either way, it's perhaps not unreasonable to suggest that there was still quite a strong thread when it comes to or when it came to seeing society or culture through more of a matriarchal lens and having that reverence for the female. The uh, the the divine mother the sacred feminine and we know uh, well i can't speak on behalf of yourself but it's known that many ancient cultures had this deep respect and reverence for the sacred feminine archetype and before patriarchy overtook the reins uh, a lot of ancient wisdom traditions and cultures still very much revered and held in place those strong matriarchal uh, ties and we see that in carvings and objects around the globe when it comes to uh, re revering um, revering these these sacred right. feminine figurines and and women were women were considered uh, well we ha we had a type of matriarchy in the past in, in the Philippines uh, but a lot of people may not recognize it because they come across, they they think of matriarchy in terms of uh, the antithesis of of, patri of to toxic mm. patriarchy uh, you know of you know women dominating men but really a tr in a true matriarchy there is balance and uh so like although men were the datus like going back to the mm. messiahs uh men were the datus they were the chiefs um but uh there was a quorum of elderly women that had the final say so if the, it's, the chiefs could not arrive at a decision, then they would consult this quorum of elderly women and they had the final say. In it. So it's kind of like, okay, you boys go along, play and be chiefs and we'll step in if we need to. <laughs> <laughs> the thing. And, uh, and women, they could, they could own property, they could sell property, they could uh, uh, marry and divorce at will. And in the Visayas, if a woman divorced a man, 
she had to pay fines to her family for basically wasting her her time and her and her uh, dowry. Hmm. So they had to pay that all back with interest. And uh, yeah, so very different, uh, very different from mainland Asia, where uh, there was very strong uh, patriarchal societies there. And uh, yeah, so the feminine was definitely honored in our islands. And uh, unfortunately, with colonization, you know, it's spreading in Spanish and American culture and Japanese culture. And now uh, we have kind of low key um, influence or invasion, if you will, of uh, Korean culture into mm. the Philippines now. And these are all very patriarchal societies, and it's whittling away at uh, the remnants that we have of matriarchy. Uh, mm. which I find very sad. Uh, mm. But yeah, women were considered inherently more spiritually conscious and uh, were considered portals between this world and the other realms. Uh, women also handled the, the debt, which you know is another transition. We have a transition into this life. We have a transition out of this life. And women were there to officiate over both those aspects. Mm. Yeah, look, when we're talking about lost knowledge, uh, from what I remember, circling back to the Babylons as well, part of the mythology is that they were fed to the crocodiles by the Spaniards. I don't know how much legitimacy there is within <laughs> this, but it's certainly, you know, it's, it's an interesting lens to look through when it comes to another method to wipe out indigenous culture and traditions and beliefs and wisdom and supplant right. and enforce those Catholic ideas into the people. Right. And so, you know, they, they were, there's this uh, story that they were chopped up and fed to crocodiles, which inadvertently, if you understand our ancient culture, would make them into gods. Mm. Because the crocodile is the, is the animal form of the Anito or the ancestor spirit. So in effect, would have deified them. Mm. Uh, you have similar uh, concept, uh, like in Hawaii, where what they would strip the bones of the remaining flesh. The bones are put into special uh, baskets and hidden in caves or put in sacred places, but the flesh would be fed to sharks, who is their form of anito or what they call amakua in Hawaiian tradition. And that deifies them. You know, mm. that, uh, that also goes back to some of the aspects that we have of the the headhunting culture that we had in the past that, you know, you would eat part of the fallen warrior to take his soul or spirit into you. And then you embody him. He becomes a part of you. So actually feeding them to Anito forms like the crocodile would deify them. It would make them into gods, uh, what we would think of as gods or, or ancestor gods. Mm. Uh, mm. And so the Sp Spaniards were, even though it was a horrible thing for them to, you know, kill and dismember them. They were inadvertently creating creating gods out of our out of those of our land. Mm. <laughs> wow, so interesting. I just had a side thought here, tying back into shamanic culture. And I don't know if you've come across anything in your research, but in a lot of shamanic cultures, the the shaman would often enter the spirit world through a variety of means. It could be through a cave, climbing up a silver cord, riding on the the heartbeat of their drum. It could be with the help of a spirit ally. And I've also come across these, these, uh, these descriptions of them riding or taking a canoe into the spirit world. And while there's certainly some sort of mythological or symbolic strand woven into these old tales and traditions, I'm actually wondering if there is any connection to the actual process of using a canoe to voyage to distant lands and in a sense maybe perhaps there could have been a crossover between symbology and practicality because we're talking about peoples that were undeniably uh, deeply enmeshed within seafaring culture so perhaps when they're talking about journeying to the underworld or the lower worlds or the upper worlds the other worlds there could be some link there but i know that in one of your instagram posts you said something to the degree of you mentioned that due to the the curvature of the earth as you are sailing towards an island it seems to rise up out of the, the ocean over in the horizon. And yes. I would love to, for you to be able to link into the, the story of the, the hook and the jawbone and mm. fished up out of the ocean, but we can get to that. But conversely, as we are sailing away from the island, it seems to sink into the ocean figuratively, 
going into the underworld. So I don't know if there's actual, actually any kind of symbolic practical link there, but interesting to muse upon. So there are, there's two possibilities with some of these stories. Um, sometimes it's a reference to the physical and sometimes it's a reference to the spiritual. And, um, and both can be true. But uh, like you mentioned, the westerly direction is associated with the underworld uh, because the sun, the moon, the stars, they rise in the east. So that's associated with the heavens. Uh, they travel across the vault of the sky and they set in the west, which is the and go underground and into the figurative underworld. And like you mentioned, it's, it is just a reference to the curvature of the earth. That being said, the underworld is also say, associated with uh, the spiritual world as well, as well as the, the heavens. So traveling to the ancestral realm and meeting your ancestors there. Now, if you encounter stories like that, then we're talking about some kind of tra travel, you know, in a shamanic way. Mm -hmm. Or, or conversely, meeting gods or meeting ancestors in the upper world or in the sky world or in the heavens. Uh, it can be both. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to kind of discern uh, based on the rest of the story, are they talking about physically traveling or are they talking about spiritually traveling mm -hmm. uh, or shamanic travel? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the story. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, so I'd love to circle back around here and dive into some of the cross-cultural pollination that we find throughout our seafaring brothers and sisters, cousins, our ancestors. And upon my own uh, research, I've come across a lot of divided views, especially when it comes to our Filipino heritage and our ties with other areas, other islands, other cultures. Uh, so much so that I've seen people getting offended and getting into heated online arguments when links are made between Philippines and these other areas that I'm speaking to, Pacific Islanders, Polynesians, Micronesians, Austronesians, and all the rest of it. So firstly, have you come across some of these indifferences yourself and what do you make of them? And secondly, perhaps we can use this as another little launching pad to jump into some more threads and that is diving into the things, some of the things that you get into in your book, The Forgotten Children of Maui. Sure, sure. Um, I've, I've encountered that for decades now. <laughs> okay. The moment, the moment that I started uh, posting things on MySpace. <laughs> okay, that's old school. <laughs> with, yeah, uh, posting things about uh, cultural similarities with Polynesians. Um, again, uh, I was trying to explain the connection that I felt, you know, decades ago in Hawaii and, uh, you know, and found all these similarities, oh, you know, just, it's, it's just so similar to what you find in the Pacific. Uh, everything from the manner of our dress, um, obviously our tattooing is very similar. A lot of people can't differentiate, uh, especially uneducated people, they can't differentiate between uh, Filipino uh, tattooing and uh, Samoan tattooing. Unless you know those nuances, uh, you might mistake one for the other. Mm. And uh, and then you also have, you know, um, oral traditions that tie back into each other. Not every group in the Philippines ties in. Uh, others, uh, it's through cross-pollination or, or uh, uh, parallel evolution after a, a split way back when. But uh, there are, then there are also stories of, of people traveling back and forth. And uh, Maui or Lomawi, again, as we call him, uh, obviously does that. Uh, you, if you understand all these euphemisms that are found in our oral traditions that we just really, unfortunately, don't understand anymore. But uh, yeah, I've encountered this great debate. And the the reality is is that if you want to classify Filipinos according to uh, modern geographical boundaries, and uh, I would remind everyone that these geopolitical boundaries were established by uh, Europeans and Western culture um, based on colonization, and so uh, 
regulating the Philippines to Southeast Asia? Sure, you could say we're Asian because of that. But culturally, uh, that's a whole different thing. Mm. Uh, we do have little hallmarks of mainland Asian culture, but that's come through cultural diffusion by uh, Chinese traders coming to our islands, first recorded by the Chinese in the 800s. Um, and so things like pansit, obviously Chinese. Lumpia, lumpia is a Chinese word. It's, it's Fukien or originates as a Fukien uh, word. It's not uh, indigenous. Uh, people want to know, well, what's indigenous Filipino food? Anything that is uh, an adobo, and even though that uh, comes from the Spanish adobar, uh, that type of technique of cooking, that's always been ours. And I'm largely regurgitating some of the information that my my apprentice uh, and scheduling manager, Natalia Rojas, um, has shared with me because she's a Filipino uh, gastronomy expert. Hmm. But, um, you know, there's, uh, there's when you strip that all away, all these little um, pieces of mainland Asian culture, what, what do you have left? Uh, we, we have a culture that is very similar to the rest of the Pacific. In fact, uh, rice culture is introduced. Uh, mm. If you know the oral traditions, rice was procured uh, or sometimes stolen and brought to the islands. Uh, it, became, it became a type of currency. Um, in the oral traditions, we formerly grew taro or root crops, uh, uh, what you'd call uh, gabi. Uh, in a, in the in Tagalog, mm. that uh, that root crop predates rice, and all those rice terraces that we have up in the north were formerly taro. They uh, and but because rice is also de- grown in a Swidden culture, like taro, um, and the Chinese used that as a type of currency, and that was something they could trade. It became uh, a prestige food. It became a type of currency. It could be measured out. It could be loaned. It could be collected with interest. Uh, and so, in effect, it, it changed uh, that aspect of our culture. Mm. So even rice is introduced to the Philippines. It, you know, And everyone associates that with uh, mainland Asian culture. But rice isn't indigenous either. Formerly, it was the root crops. It was ube. It was uh, kamote. It was taro prior to that. Mm. So... You strip all these little pieces of Chinese culture and mainland Asian culture away, what you're left with is something is very, very similar to what you find further out in the Pacific. Hmm. And uh, what's also interesting is uh, that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in oral traditions, it appears that people were traveling back and forth uh, from the Philippines, what we think of as the Philippines to further parts of the Pacific and then traveling back there are, there are words that are a little bit like an anachronism found in our languages you don't find cognates of those words in the surrounding area you only find them further out in the Pacific and you know because uh, I'm Ilocano I'm more familiar with with uh, some of the the weird anachronistic words in our language like like the word uh, Pa'au, for ocean. You don't find that anywhere in the Philippines except you do find it in Samoa. Hmm. Uh, that word uh, Pa'au is a contraction of Ito'au, means the ocean beyond the reef. Um, or the w- word that we use for blue, uh, Sami Sami in, in Ilocano is, is the word for, is another word for, you know, uh, the ocean in Samoan. Mm. Just things like that that are mm. that you know if you're looking on the the language family tree should join down here, but they don't they're connected way up here on the tree, and so how do you explain that unless people are traveling back and forth and um and certainly the 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 stories of Maui or Lomawi illustrate this even more so mm. Mm. Yeah, I also heard you mention something in a, a short video that you posted somewhere along the way that it might have been the sweet potato 
of the Philippines. You, I think you mentioned yes. it was of Native American origin, which obviously alludes to there being some sort of ancient route between the Americas to Hawaii, Philippines, amongst many of the other visitations and cross-cultural pollinations that were happening all throughout the Pacific. Right, right. And so um, the ancient Austronesian people or our ancestors, they reached the Americas. Um, there's there's some Native American tribes um, up north that have the same creation tradition as we do. Um, a lot of their culture is very similar to ours. Um, their taboos are very similar to ours. Uh, and the sweet potatoes from Central and South America. So we had contact there as well. Uh, there are place names in Peru that are very Polynesian. Like there's even a place name called Maui. Mm. Uh, but the sweet potato, the, the, what we think of as camote, camote is a Hispanicized word of camote uh, that you find there in South America or Central America. But we have indigenous words for the sweet potato and for specific varieties of the sweet potato. And what's interesting is like, for example, in Ilocano, uh, we have one variety of sweet potato that we call por sasana, and the Maori call it poranga. Uh, very similar word, s- mm. same variety of sweet potato, but as far as I know, the Spaniards never got down to Aotearoa. And so, mm. <laughs> how do you explain that? Mm. But the traditions about these, about sweet potatoes, both in the Philippines and with our uh, Maori cousins, uh, say that Maui brought it to our islands. And so I'm more inclined to believe what our ancestors say about the origin of this Mm. uh, rather than a Western scholar that's going to try and explain it through a Eurocentric lens. You know, the Spaniards must have brought it because, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, these poor savages couldn't do it themselves (laughs) kind of a thing. (laughs) Sure. So, yeah, look, it seems evident there was there was that connection between all of these different cultures and places based off your work when you're tying in the linguistics when you're tying in the the cultural connections, when you're tying in the mythologies as well. And just circling back, as I mentioned, I would love if you know the story well off the top of your head, the story of uh, Maui or the Mauig uh, fishing up the islands. Oh, yeah. Um, so the the idea of fishing up islands, again, is that, that metaphor of of knowing that the earth is round and the curvature of the earth, because as you sail towards it, like you mentioned earlier, uh, it seems to rise up out of the horizon figuratively. It's been fished up out of the water. And the Mawig's or, or Maui's name alludes to this because his, his name is a sobriquet or uh, a, a sobriquet or a descriptive nickname of the feats that he does. And uh, the Mawig's name is derived from the word Lawig, which can mean fish hook uh, in uh, some parts of Ilocandia. It can mean hawk, or um, and in in Tagalog you would we would say lawin, uh, which means hawk. Uh, Lawig also means to sail or to voyage in uh, in uh, Bisayan, and those are all aspects of his name. And the conjugated form of of Lawig is Lumawig to continue on. Uh, Mao in Polynesian means to continue forward, the same as Lumawi. So, uh, yeah, even his name alludes to all these aspects that most people are familiar with through the, the Disney film uh, Moana. Mm. But, uh, you know, because he carries around this big fish hook and turns into a giant hawk and teaches Moana how to avoid or sail, you know, all those aspects are, are part of his name if you understand the the Filipino root word for his name, Lawig. And then we have tattoos uh, that are uh, mnemonic devices that commemorate uh, his feats of fishing up islands. Um, you find that uh, in the Philippines as well as other parts of uh, the Pacific. Um, so yeah, it's it's there. The the term uh, Lalawigan, like Lalawigan ng uh, Cebu, uh, the, what we think of as the province of Cebu, is really when if you go back to ancient Visayan, Lalawigan means uh, to hook the land, mm. uh, and it's uh, a reference to dropping anchor. And uh, the the people that were voyaging on that that canoe could be considered Lawig or Lomawig mm. until they hooked the land. 
Um, so mm -hmm. these concepts are just kind of veiled by uh, modern Filipino uh, understanding of, of these terms. But it's all there. You know, we just have to dig a little bit and uh, get down to the, the roots. Mm. I wish more people were doing that, <laughs> not just uh, me and my apprentices. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. So when you're linking all of these creation stories and myths and ancestral migration patterns and cultural commonalities, when you're taking all this into account, what is your take on where we actually all come from? The origins, the deep roots of humanity, of our ancestry, if you will. Well, um, well, for Filipinos, I, I would say that uh, the Philippines is not our homeland uh, because in the oral traditions, these uh, what we think of as creation stories, uh, if you understand the, the figurative language, the metaphors and euphemisms used in them, you, you understand that we migrated from somewhere else. And that, that place, all that we know of is located probably somewhere in the West we, or down in the South. Uh, we don't know for sure. We, all we know is that our ancestors, uh, Apolaki and Apobai, or Lalaki and Babae, our word for male and female, uh, uh, these ancient ancestors, these ancient progenitors were uh, voyagers and they arrived in our islands. Uh, in, the, in the mythology, uh, by arriving in a bamboo tube, and this too is just a, a, a figurative uh, way of describing voyaging by canoe because being born from a bamboo tube alludes to coming by canoe. And if any of you have ever ridden in one of our our uh, banca or paral, um, we uh, use a lot of bamboo in the construction of those vessels. And so, be and all all those canoes anciently were considered female because uh, canoes are, if you look at them from the top down, they're shaped like female genitalia. Hmm. And so when you arrive by canoe and you, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, actually, you're surrounded by water, just like a baby in the womb inside this symbolic uh, uh, female genitalia. And then when you make landfall, you are born from that bamboo, so to speak. And, uh, and so, you know, the Spaniards thought, you know, you, you silly savages, you were thought, you think you were born from a piece of wood, but really they didn't understand the, the figurative language. And, and unfortunately, uh, our people today were so divorced from these concepts and ideas that we don't even understand them anymore. Uh, we just think of them as fairy tales or, you know, we condescendingly refer to them as uh, myths. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, there was uh, the maritime tradition throughout the Philippines. I mean, the Portuguese found uh, people from Luzon all the way down in Java and, and in the Malukus down south. I mean, we were all over the place in Southeast Asia. And then the oral traditions also allude to going further out into the Pacific. So, yeah, there, there was not only uh, uh, a descent from a common ancestors, but there was also cultural exchange happening after that, that uh, dispersion. Mm. And uh, these, these two ancestors, uh, Laki and Bai or Lalaki and Babai, they're found all over the Pacific under, in various forms. In Aotearoa, uh, Laki becomes Raki or Rangi. And uh, Babai, she's uh, no, known as Papa. Just, we don't... Uh, they don't have a B sound in, in New Zealand uh, among the Maori, so they use a P instead. But it's the same ancestress. And uh, you find uh, that ancestor that changes from Laki to Raki to Rangi to Rangi Nui to Rangi Atea or Atea Rangi uh, to Atea to Wakea in Hawaii. And Papa is the same all the way over there. Mm. And so all these people throughout the Pacific are claiming that descent from the very same progenitors by name, mm -hmm. uh, including the Philippines, uh, and also uh, some of our cousins in Borneo. So, you know, this is the diaspora of a very large family, really. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's no wonder that we have so many commonalities, uh, like you mentioned, linguistically, culturally, uh, as well as genetically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, it really gives me a, 
a feeling of a of a heavy heart knowing that so much of this ancient wisdom has been lost to the sands of time and geez big thanks and props to people like yourself and your team that are doing the work to try and uncover getting your hands in the soil and grazing your knuckles around trying to find the remnants <laughs> of what's left and it's obviously just not the not just the filipino culture that could do with the the reins of realignment to nurture those soils of cultural restoration so i'd love to ask yes. what you might say to the great many people out there when it comes to seeking some sort of cultural restoration because in a lot of instances people are disconnected from their ancestral cultures especially here in australia where as a collective we form such a diverse community from all around the globe and our ancestors right. often uprooted themselves from wherever they were to come here or to find themselves here on this continent which are lands that were stolen and which were colonized from our indigenous first nation australian aboriginals and we're not only not only disconnected from our own heritage but we're often disconnected to the ancient wisdom and cultures of the lands that we're living on today so I guess the question is, what's your approach here and what kind of message do you have to pass on when it comes to cultural restoration? Well, I think it's important, you know, in cultural restoration. And part of the problem we have here in the States is that um, sometimes people are lazy in wanting to do the, do the legwork for this. Uh, they'd rather reimagine things or, uh, you know, just ascribe their own meanings, uh, especially when it comes to tattoos and and even with ritual, uh, just kind of hodgepodge things together. And it's important to to try and understand our ancestors the way they, they saw themselves, the way they perceived the world. Uh, that was something that was very hard for me to wrap my head around in the beginning to see things from a more holistic standpoint, rather than the way I've been raised and trained to think in a Western mindset of critical thinking, for example, of chopping things up into little pieces and trying to understand those little uh, shards. Uh, it's better to look at the whole puzzle rather than an individual piece. And so it, that's why in wanting to learn about tattoos, for example, um, I needed to understand the culture as a whole to understand the meanings there. You can't just say, oh, this one design means a dog. Well, what does that mean? Do you want to, you, you like dogs? Um, you, you know, they're a good friend or a pet? Uh, or do you like to eat them? Or, you know, you don't understand the context of that, especially if you're raised in a, in a Western way. And, you know, you would have to know that you know what dogs are, dogs were uh, a food item, but they were do they were only eaten uh, in the old days ritually. They were uh, they were a way of transforming the soul of a slain warrior into a companion for the the warrior who had slain him to be his constant companion in in life and in the spirit world. Uh, it's a very, you would have to understand the headhunting practices. You would have to understand those rituals in that aspect. But I see a lot of people have taken uh, my, my work and said, oh, this, is, this, this tattoo means a dog. And they're putting on people who, you know, just like dogs. You know, I'm a, I'm a dog breeder. I want this tattoo because it's a dog. No, you don't understand. That's only for people who have gone through these rituals and ceremonies and have slain people. It's a very, you would, you wouldn't know that unless you understood everything as a whole. You can find bits and pieces, but you have to look at everything holistically. How does this particular practice tie into these other practices and nuances of the culture? Because it's part of a whole. And certainly with doing both or tattooing, uh, you got to understand that the basis of the literacy of the, of the designs as well you know mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to end up uh, making embarrassing marks on people and i've seen that unfortunately mm -hmm. with uh, uh tattoo artists you know not talking about ritual practitioners or mamba bato talking about tattoo artists who just find something in a book or get a superficial understanding from a, from one source or another and like oh okay 
this means family? Okay, fine. We'll put that on there. Or this, this is just Filipino tribals? Well, I'll arrange it the way I want to. And, you know, years ago, I ran, I was in Caesar's Palace uh, with my wife on a date and uh, ran into this uh, big kind of roided out uh, Filipino guy, you know, one of those guys that looks at you like, you know, do you even go to the gym, bro? Kind of thing. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I approached him and I said, I, I noticed your, the tattoos on your arm, uh, they're from the Philippines. And he goes, yeah, these are, you know. I want to represent that I'm a strong Filipino man. And, you know, this is, the, you know, I'm, I'm proud of where I come from. And I'm like, that's great. You know, thanks for sharing with me, bro. And, you know, I recognize where the designs were from. And they were uh, from down south among the Manobu people down there. And they were actually women's breast tattoos that he had on his arm. And I know brother wasn't planning on breastfeeding anybody anytime soon. No. <laughs> but, you know, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that. Mm. And, uh, but that's the unfortunate thing that happens when people just don't do the depth of research that they should. They just want to, you know, skip a few steps. Uh, oh, we smudged in the Philippines? Well, I got a whole bu big sage bundle at home. You know, we didn't use that. We use other things, and then we have uh, different smudges, for example, for different ritual types of uh, problems to, that we need to care for. So, you know, just because you learn, oh, yeah, we smudged anciently doesn't mean go pick up a sage stick and, and wave it around. Uh, learn things as thoroughly as you can, because the, the wonderful benefit of it is that you get privy just a little bit to the mind of your ancestors and how they thought, mm. how they perceived the world. And, uh, and it's astounding the genius behind it. Uh, just doing the book, uh, you see the genius behind it. You know, they most people look at it as a very simple, you know, primitive way of, of tattooing, but there's some real wisdom behind it. The real genius just, uh, even the shape of the teeth on the combs are designed so that they don't penetrate too deep into the skin. They act as a natural stopper unless you just kind of whack the hell out of it or something, you know? Um, but just brilliant. Um, and it, it's a, it, we do ourselves a disservice when we, when we come from that Western mindset that, uh, uh, we're trying to understand these primitive ancestors. You no, know, they were very sophisticated. And if you and if you approach that with a, with a just a, a small amount of humility, mm. you're a little bit more open to receiving that wisdom. Mm. Um, and in our old beliefs, our ancestors, our uh, Nito, they guide us. They they want to interact with us, but not very many people listen. Mm. And uh, when we're open to those whisperings uh, that come from that inner voice, um, sometimes they can guide us into more productive paths. They can guide us in our research themselves. So they mm. want to be discovered. Mm. Uh, they love us. They, they look. They look after us. But how many of us want to develop a relationship with them? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, a lot of our batok uh, motifs are to honor that connection and to enhance that connection that we have with those on the other side of the veil. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's been one of the most uh, gratifying aspects of doing this practice, is, is seeing people receive that and having them, you know, either during their, their ceremony or after their ceremony, and sometimes prior to their ceremony, just have this enhanced communication with the other side and uh, and it becomes very real, you know, before it's kind of this ethereal thing. Oh, yeah, the ancestors are there, but then they have an experience and um, and it just drives everything home. It becomes real in it to them. Mm. So <laughs> rambling again. Sorry yeah, no, a beautiful answer when it comes to cultural restoration and you bring up some very, very pertinent points that if we want to 
restore culture, we have to have that willingness to to go deep and to understand things within the right context, to have that contextual understanding and look at things from yeah. the holistic lens. There should be a balance between, you know, Western academia and indigenous ways of knowing, mm -hmm. you know, dreams, uh, intuitive knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's an aspect too, you know, and, and what I find uh, is that is a true principle, if it is a true thing, that the indigenous ways of knowing and the academic way of knowing, they will marry up eventually. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we cut ourselves off from that indigenous ways, you know, those indigenous ways of knowing. For example, with, uh, with our, our Tiboli cousins down south, uh, they're literally called the dream weavers because the patterns that they put into their, their textiles they dream about them first. Those designs are given through the spirit world first. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason that that can't continue uh, in the way that we restore these ancient practices. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have said it better myself, Lane. I think this is a good place for us to start to wrap things up. I've got a couple of questions from some people in the community, if you'd be happy sure. to answer them. Yeah, great. One of them was in regards to tattooing, just a short question about the, the ink. Is the ink the same substrate that was used in a from a traditional context, or is it the modern variety that's still used because of whatever reasons, whether it's ease of access or hygiene? Uh, a little of both. Mm. Um, I used to make my own ink, uh, but it's pretty labor intensive. It, uh, basically, you're gonna you're gonna burn resinous wood uh, that creates a really sooty smoke, and you're gonna collect that soot on the bottom of a pan or uh, or a lid some type of type of even a stone placed over the fire uh you scrape that off you mix it with some sugar cane juice or some some oil like coconut oil uh that acts as um uh, the as and as that sugar cane juice begins to ferment it acts as a fixative um that that's the basic ink um is just soot and water what you'd find in india ink really and, and um but uh, the traditional ink doesn't keep too long. Um, they're looking at maybe four or five days before it starts turning into vinegar, and um, and then it's no good. So it doesn't doesn't travel very well, doesn't keep very well, um, and I have to burn a bit of wood to to create it. Uh, a number of years ago, um, when I was stretching for the Suluape family out of Samoa, I was uh, close up for them. Uh, whenever they visit, and uh, they befriended a man named Mario Barth, who actually is here in Las Vegas. And uh, Mario Barth, through his company called Intense Inks, created Suluape Black, which is was originally specifically made for hand tapping. Uh, it's uh, a lot thicker than a regular ink, um, and it is basically soot and water, but it's made to Western tattoo standards, so it's it's clean, uh, it's sterile, and uh, and that's what I use today, is Suluapi Black. But the recipe is basically the same. It's it's uh, carbon or soot and water. Mm, okay, great. Next question: When indigenous peoples of the Philippines are brought up in conversation, in particular the ones who practiced shamanism or earth-based worship. Is there a specific ethnic group or island most commonly referenced? Because from their understanding, the Philippines as an entire unified country of a thousand plus islands didn't seem to occur until colonization. So for them, trying to get answers on what exactly constitutes Filipino right. culture is a bit of a mind boggler in a sense. So what have you got to say in regards to that? Well, we have several ethno-linguistic groups throughout the Philippines. There's over a hundred distinct languages. Uh, the number keeps changing depending on the linguist. Mm -hmm. But uh, with, with each of those languages, you have distinct cultural uh, cultures. Uh, all the cultures are closely related within the Philippines. So there's a lot of commonalities, but there are nuances that are distinctly different. Mm -hmm. um, and where we kind of get tripped up, I think, as uh, as modern uh, people of the Philippines is that we tend to think of those that hung on to their 
traditions and were not as colonized or did or resisted colonization, uh, we we tend to label them as the indigenous peoples of the Philippines. And then, you know, if you're Tagalog, you're, you divorce yourself from that. Oh, I'm not indigenous. Mm. I'm Tagalog. Really, Tagalog people, um, Ilocano people, all these places that, uh, you know, people think of themselves uh, as something other than indigenous. Really, our ancestors were indigenous as well, too. Uh, it's just that now we were, we're wearing pants instead of a hug. You know, or loincloths. Uh, you would never go to, you know, you know, someone of Aboriginal descent and say, "Oh, you're not Aboriginal because you're you're wearing you know Western clothing now." You would never disrespect a person that way. You would never go to a Native American person and say, "Oh, you're not riding around in a in a loincloth. You're not you're not indigenous anymore." Uh, we have to rid ourselves of that type of idea because our indigenous culture is there. The nuances are, are there. We just have to recover them. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of uh, decolonization in terms of the views that we have of what is indigenous and what is not. But each, each ethno-linguistic group, again, has its own specific ways of practice. Uh, sometimes they're similar to other groups. Sometimes they're not. Uh, but again, the cultures of the Philippines are very closely related. But I would never uh, take Kalinga tattooing, for example, uh, something that is specifically Kalinga, and put it on a person who of non-Kalinga descent. That's not my prerogative. Um, it's not. It's not your prerogative saying, "Oh, I like that design. It's pretty." Uh, I'm from the Philippines. I'll put that on because you know it ultimately comes from the Philippines. That nationalistic. Uh, view of all of our islands as a Western construct. Uh, and why would you put something on your body that your ancestors would not recognize? Mm -hmm. Why would you adopt someone else's ancestors? Find your own traditions. And, and that's the problem that we have right now within the diaspora of the Philippines is that uh, we have people that come from ethno-linguistic groups that don't have a tradition anymore or that the tradition is extinct and so they're they'll say well you know i saw this from apo huang od our our elder up in kalinga it's from the philippines i'll wear it you shouldn't do that that's appropriation so like for example we're my apprentices and i were still rebuilding uh, kind of a visual vocabulary for the major ethno-linguistic groups of the Philippines. Specifically, we're looking in places where the practice has been very thoroughly exterminated, like places like, you know, like uh, the Tagalog region, the Kapapangan region, uh, the, Bicol, the Bicol region. Uh, this, these are places where the tattooing was thoroughly obliterated, and we're now looking at archaeological evidence, uh, things like uh, uh, pottery. Uh, yeah. Often what's on the, the pottery is found on the skin as well. And we see that consistently up through northern Luzon. Uh, the Kalinga people, when they have in their textile tradition, in their pottery tradition, uh, the motifs that are on the skin are also on these, these, this, these aspects of their material culture. And that's how we've been rebuilding in, in the places that have lost their practice, we've been reconstructing the visual language of their ancestors we uh we have to be transparent with people from these regions you know we don't know exactly what the meanings are from for these designs we don't even know how they might have been placed on the body we're looking at consensus at this point and extrapolation based on communities that are nearby that had similar designs or or, or uh, even identical designs we can infer from them what these designs might mean and where they were placed on the body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have to be fully transparent with uh, the people that come to me for, for Batok, that sometimes we are, this is a process of cultural recovery. And as further research and light and knowledge comes to, uh, to us, we, we sometimes have to uh, make corrections. Um, but often it's, it's kind of a wonderful confirmation when, you, you do this type of research and then further things come, come to light and there it is, you know, just what you might have learned uh, 
from an indigenous way of knowing. And um, one of my examples of that, if you'll indulge me mm. for a second, mm. is uh, having dreams of, of uh, an old Apolakai uh, uh, old Apolakai that uh, visited me in my dreams and explained what the tattoos meant. And I, it was such a vivid, powerful dream that I wrote everything down. And of course, my Western brain's going, you know, how am I going to put this in any of my manuscripts? Because you know, who in the right mind is going to believe me? They'll, oh, this is what this one do- design means because I had a dream about it. You know, Western scholars are just kind of, oh yeah, sure, you know, yeah. whatever, not taking you seriously. But six months after those dreams, um, I found documentation for every single one of those designs that that uh, Tatang Lakai gave to me in a dream. Uh, and that's why I say, you know, indigenous ways of knowing and Western ways of knowing, they often meet up and uh, join hands, uh, mm. especially when things are done in a, in a true way. Uh, mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. A beautiful way for us to close up this little dialogue between us as well, Lane. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> hey, so whereabouts can people find you? Where would you like to direct people? I know you've got books, you have your social media, you've got your website. I will include them all in the show notes to this episode, but if there's anywhere that you want to direct people now, um, please go for it. Um, yeah, if you feel uh, called or to reach out to me, um, of course, visit my website. You can contact me through there, uh, lanewilkin.com. Uh, also on Instagram, uh, I, I have Facebook, but I'm not very active on there. Uh unless you hit me up through uh, messenger, but sometimes I get a, a huge amount of uh, people coming through and it takes me a while to answer. So please be patient with me, but uh, I'm most active on Instagram and through my website. Uh, if you, you just look for me there. Awesome brother. Well, look, lastly, just as we opened up the space, I'd love to invite you to share something to close up our time together, whether it's another prayer or just some brief words of gratitude or thanks or anything that comes through. Oh, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, for uh, having me on your podcast and and uh, for all of you listeners for having uh, uh, me, you know, listening to me ramble on for a while. But I, uh, I really appreciate, uh, I want to express my gratitude and appreciation to all of our ancestors who've directed us in various forms one way or another who protected us who guided us uh, in our ways of knowing in the practices that we are are struggling to recover uh, uh, and i uh, i hope that all of us search for our ancestors regardless of your ethnic group wherever you may come from uh, your ancestors care about you. They love you, and they want to to be a part of your life. And I, I pray that all of us will allow that to happen. Mm-hmm. I hold to that. Thanks, Lane. Beautiful.